Well, we are finishing up our series today called I Dare You to Move. We started five or six weeks ago by saying that some people are like this. Others are like this. But by the Word of God and the presence of God and the power of God, your life can become like this. This series has been all about resiliency. We define resiliency as bounce back ability. Over the course of this series, we've taken a look at the resiliency of Paul, the resiliency of Peter at length specifically. And today we're going to go all the way back to the Old Testament for what I believe to be one of, if not the best bounce back story in your entire Old Testament. I want you to open up today to 1 Samuel chapter 30. If you'll remember way back, the children of Israel, when they were governed by the judges, they cried out for a king. They wanted to be like the other nations, so they cried out for a king, which was really not a good idea. It wasn't a good motivation to be like the other nations. God had called them to be a unique people, but they cried out for a king. And so God said to the prophet Samuel, go ahead and give them a king. And so Saul, who was head and shoulders above the rest, was chosen. He had the outward appearance of a great king, but after a while they found out that he was not a great king. As a matter of fact, Saul became disobedient. Uh, for instance, one of the times, and there are many of them, but one of the times he was instructed by God to take out the Amalekites, take them out completely, because God said, it's time, it's time for me to exact vengeance on them for attacking my people when they came out of Egypt. Hundreds of years later, God says, now it's time. Take them all out. Don't leave anything. Don't take anything for yourself. Don't take any spoils of war. Nothing. Take them all out. And so Saul went out to battle, and God granted him the victory, but he did not take everybody out. He let some go. He, ha he hung on. He imprisoned the king, Agag, and he took the best livestock and the best sheep for himself. The Lord told Samuel, Samuel was grieved by it. Samuel came and confronted King Saul. And, and, and as he's walking up to Saul, the story is amazing because Saul says to Samuel, Samuel, so great to see you. I have obeyed everything the Lord told me to do. Samuel says, well, then what is the sound of bleeding sheep in my ear? And Saul says, oh, that was the people, that was the warriors, that was the soldiers. They, they took that stuff uh, so that they could sacrifice it to the Lord your God. Samuel said, listen, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams because rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And since you did not obey the Lord, he's taking the kingdom from you. He's, he's looked for a man after his own heart, and he has found him. He is a neighbor of yours, and he's better than you. And Saul starts to plead and plead and plead. And finally, he says, well, well at least go before the people with me and worship with me. And, he, and, and Samuel relents, and he says, okay, fine. I'll go, and I'll worship before the people so you don't lose face. We'll worship together. He sees Saul worship together. And then at the end, he tells him, get me King a Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And when he comes, Samuel takes Saul's sword and just whacks him. And then he turns around and he starts to walk away. And King Saul reaches out for Samuel's robe and he rips it. And Samuel turns around and he says, And so has the Lord ripped the kingdom from you today. Samuel starts to grieve over Saul's disobedience. And so God speaks to him. And it's, God says to him, How long will you grieve for Saul? Are you going to grieve for him forever? Fill your horn with oil and go. How many of you know that's a great statement? Fill your horn with oil and say that with me today. Fill your horn with oil and go. That's, a, that, that's another message for another time, right? And he sends him off to Bethlehem. And there there's a man named Jesse who's got eight sons. 
As Samuel gets to the city gates, the city elders are terrified. Are you here for judgment? He says, no, I'm here for a sacrifice. Gather everyone to me. Consecrate yourselves. Get Jesse and his sons, and they have this sacrifice. It's quite a ceremony. It's quite a, a celebration. And so then, as he's got his horn filled with oil, he knows he's supposed to go to Jesse's house. He knows he's supposed to anoint somebody from Jesse's house. And so he looks at Jesse's oldest, Eliab, who again, kind of like Saul, is head and shoulders above the rest. And Samuel figures, you know what? This must be, look at this guy. This must be the next king of Israel. And the Lord says, no, I have rejected him. Next son, Abinadab, no, I have rejected him. Next son, Shammah, no, I have rejected him. Seven sons pass before Samuel. But, and then he says, is, is, is there another one? And the Lord says to him, listen, you're looking at the outward appearance. I don't look at the outward appearance. I look at the heart. So Jesse says, well, yeah, yeah I've got another a very young son. He's out, you know, he's just out watching the sheep. And Samuel says, we will not sit down till he gets here. And so here he comes in smelling like sheep. Not looking like any of the other brothers. He's got red hair, light eyes, although he's very good looking. He comes in. At this point in time, he is somewhere between 10 and 12 years old. And the Lord says to Samuel, this is the one, anoint him. And so he pours out this oil on little David. Nobody knows what it's for, except for Samuel and the Lord. David returns to the sheep. Samuel goes back to his home in Ramah. And now Saul is enraged. As a matter of fact, the Bible says an evil spirit, a distressing evil spirit has come upon him. The spirit of the Lord has departed from him, so an evil spirit comes upon him. And he can't be consoled. Somebody says, you know what, maybe if there's music, maybe if there's somebody singing, maybe that'll do it. And they said, does anybody know anybody who can sing? And somebody says, yeah, there's this little kid. He's on a hillside in Bethlehem, and he's out there, and he writes songs. He's like a singer-songwriter, a little red-headed kid, and, and he's out there with his acoustic guitar. We can, you know, I've, I've heard him. He's pretty good. Okay, get him. And so they bring David in to Saul, and he begins to sing his songs, the Lord is my shepherd, I... He goes before me, you know, like we sung this morning, and, he, and, and, and Saul feels better. So Saul says, okay, you've got to stay here. You can go back and forth between your father's house and stuff, but for the most part, I need you here because whenever this distressing spirit would come upon him, David would have to play and sing. In the meantime, the Philistines draw up against the Israel uh, army, and they're on two sides of a hill, and... Back in those days, that's the way it would happen. The armies would come on each side of a hill and then they would choose a champion from each one. And that champion would not only, listen to this, not only represent the people, so the Philistines would choose one, the Israelis would choose one. They not only represented the people, but in ancient times they believed they represented their gods. Now remember, Israel's leader, King Saul, no longer has the Spirit of God on his life. He's been distressed by an evil spirit. And so since the Spirit of God has departed from him, that army is without leadership. And so they choose a champion. Of course, Goliath of Gath stands taller than nine feet. Definitely some pituitary gland issues, okay? <laughs> It's gigantic. He's got 125 pound armor on him. His spear, the javelin head, weighs about 90 pounds. He's a giant of a man. He's the descendant of Anak, so the giants. He's a descendant of them. And he comes, and the Bible says he not only comes down from the army and barks out blasphemies at Israel, but he goes to the bottom and starts coming up their side. Very brazen, very in their face. And there's not a champion among them because, again, they're leaderless. David, who right now happens to be visiting dad, dad says, listen, your three oldest brothers, Eliab, Abinadab, and Shammah, they're at war. They're following Saul. They're over there. Go bring them lunch and, you know, take the king some cheese. 
And so he gets his little red flyer wagon. You know, again, he's all of probably 12. He hasn't yet been bar mitzvahed. So he's, he's about 12 years old and he heads on off there and he sees the sight. He sees Goliath of Gath coming down, coming up, barking out blasphemies at the God of Israel and at the people of Israel. And he can't believe what's happening. Abinadab sees him get interested, and Abinadab's like, you're just an ambulance chaser. You're just here to see the blood shed. Just go back home and tend those few sheep for dad. And 12-year-old David says, is there not a cause? <laughs> Somehow he makes his way into King Saul and says, I'll, t I'll take him out. I'll, I, let, 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 your servant has killed a lion and a bear with his own hands. This uncircumcised Philistine shall be nothing for me. Saul, of course, puts his armor, you know the story, on to David, which must have been a hysterical sight. And David he takes it off and he says, I haven't proven these things. And so he goes out. And he goes down to the bottom where there's a brook and he gets five smooth stones out of the brook. Goliath sees him and is like, are you kidding me? Are you getting some stones? Do you have some sticks? Am I a dog? And little David says, I will feed your flesh to the birds of the air this day. You defy the living God. You come to me with a javelin and a spear. I come to you in the name of the God of heaven's armies. And I will feed your flesh to the birds of the air as it is this day. <laughs> and he takes one, just one. Sometimes it just takes one. You may have five, but, but, but it just takes one. He takes that one. And the Bible says it not only smacks... Gol Goliath is so brazen and so proud and so foolish. He doesn't even put the visor down on his helmet. It hits him in the middle of the eyes and the Bible says it sinks into his forehead. He falls flat on his face. Little David comes over and with all his might pulls out Goliath's sword. First, he sticks it in him to kill him to make sure he's, how many of you know that was wise, right? He squish, <laughs> make sure that happens. And then he whacks his head off lifts up his head, the Israeli army, who all of them thought Goliath was too big to hit, but David thought he was too big to miss. And they're all now, all of a sudden, they got muscles, and now they go and they chase the Philistine army. They have a great victory. Why? Because just as we are all in Jesus and enjoy his victory, all of Israel was in David and enjoyed that victory. David takes Saul's, uh, excuse me, takes Goliath's armor, puts it in his own tent, and carries his head around. If you really read it, he carries his head around. He carries his head all the way back to his house in Bethlehem. And then uh, the, the king called, who, who was that? Who, who was that little boy? And they're like, that's the kid that comes and plays the guitar for you. He's the son of Jesse. That, you know, I know you're in, in, a, in a foggy confusion right now, but you do know this guy. He comes in and out, and, he, and, and so he says, well, call him to me. And, and when David comes, he still still holding Goliath's head. <laughs> and he gives it to the king. And the king says to his attendants, he says, okay, now he can't go back and forth. Now he has to stay with me. You know, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Because now he begins to eye him with suspicion. And when the two of them walk out of the king's palace, the women start to sing songs of victory. And their song is, Saul has slain his thousands, David his ten thousands. And Saul's like, say what? Now things get dicey. Now Saul gets enraged even more. 
and more and more, and it's building, and David's trying to play the guitar for him and sing brand new songs to him and sing songs of the Spirit to him. And yeah, it works, and then sometimes it comes back on him, and Saul gets up one day and throws a javelin at David. David, think about this. David has to duck, get back up, and keep singing. (laughs) David's got a big heart. I said, David's got a big heart. He's a man after God's own heart. He has the capacity to duck from the guy who's trying to kill him and still love him. Gets to be too much, and so one day David's got to flee. And there's a lot more to the story in his relationship with Jonathan that we don't have time to go over, and it's beautiful. You should read the whole thing from 1 Samuel 15 all the way up to 1 Samuel 30, where we'll be today. But in the meantime, at some point, David's got to start uh, hiding in caves. And he goes to the cave of Adullam. And in the cave of Adullam, God sends to him 400 mighty men. The Bible says all who were in distress, all who were in debt, all who were discontented. Chronicles, 1 Chronicles, I think it's chapter 12, tells us that not only were they in distress and discontented and in debt, but they could also, they were mighty men of war, they could also throw stones, sling slings, and bend bows with both arms. So I like to call them David's ambidextrous ex-cons, okay? That's, that's who this motley crew was. These are fighting men. Uh, the 400 soon become 600, but while he's there with them, do you know that on two different occasions, Saul's hunting him down now, cave to cave throughout the wilderness, but on two different occasions, God delivers Saul into David's hands. And you got to read those stories too because they're absolutely amazing. I mean, the, the first one is, is, a, is a testimony to the humor, the sense of humor of God. Because David and his men are hiding way back in a cave and the Bible says King Saul walks by and says to his guys, hey, wait a second, I have to relieve myself. I hope none of you need a definition of what that means. But he walks into the back of the cave where David is. And they see him relieving himself. And David's like, and he comes up behind him and cuts off a corner of Saul's robe. And when Saul leaves the cave, David comes out and says, See, the Lord had delivered you into my hand, but I want you to know something. My hand will not come against you. I will not touch the Lord's anointed. By the way, he wasn't anointed anymore, and David still said, I won't touch the Lord's anointed. Second time it happens. But anyway, at a certain point, David's even got to join the Philistine army. At another point, he's got a fake craziness before King Achish, the king of the Philistines. But after all that happens and David removes himself from the Philistine army, he goes up against them. While Saul and Jonathan are fighting in a completely different area, David goes after the Philistines and has quite an amazing victory. It's where we pick up the story in 1 Samuel chapter 30. So they're out fighting and they get a victory on the Philistines. It takes the spoils of war as well. And in 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse 1 it says, and I'm reading today out of the King James Bible. It says, and it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag. Okay, real quickly. Ziklag is where David and these 600 men decided to camp. But it was more than a camp. It was more than a temporary place. They actually wound up living there for a year and four months. So it was more of a permanent dwelling. A year and four months. Home base was Ziklag. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites, they were fighting the Philistines, the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire. And had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. 
So David and his men came to the city. They came to their hometown where their wives and their children were. Came to the city and behold, it was burned with fire. Their homes are all burned to the ground. And their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captive, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess and Abigail, wife of Nabal the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. Stop right there for just a moment. David has come to Ziklag and he's lived there with his family, his men, and their families. They've been there for almost a year and a half. And they go out to battle against the Philistine army. And while they're fighting over there, while they're shedding blood over there, risking their lives over there, and getting the victory over there, when they come back to Ziklag, when they come back home, waiting for their wives and their children to greet them with hugs and kisses and start singing songs of victory, guess what? They find out that there are no women singing. There is no aroma of bread. There's a completely other odor altogether. There are no children running and laughing. The camp is not only deserted, it is burned to the ground. The women and the children are gone. Now, now, we see that they were taken away captive, but David and his men, they don't know that. As far as they know, they may have been taken and killed. Now, the Amalekites were Israel, Israel's fiercest enemies. They, they were specialists at preying upon vulnerabilities. They were experts at going after weaknesses. They were crafty. They attacked while David was fighting on another front and they take defenseless women and children. They were crafty and they were cunning like the serpent they served. Think about this. After fighting a fierce battle against a perennial enemy, David come, comes back to everything they've built being burned to the ground and his family being taken. His men, his fighting men, his, his, these rough, tough warriors, they break down. They weep from their guts until they can't weep anymore. They, they cannot be consoled. They're, they're lying in the ground in tears and sweat and blood. They're shouting in anguish of soul till they, till they can't anymore. And they're, they're saying, where's my wife? Where, where are my kids? And you... Son of Jesse, you made us go out to battle at the wrong time. You were careless. You were reckless. You didn't think it through. You left our neighborhood. You left our community unprotected. You didn't think about my family's security. This is on you. My home was burnt down. Everything I own I lost in this fire, and I may never see my family again, and it's on you. Fellas, I say we kill him. Fair or not, that's what these wild-eyed men are thinking. You see, Ziklag is the place in your life where you are fighting on one front and get attacked on another front. When you're fighting over here and a simultaneous battle erupts over there. When you're battling one demonic foe over here and another one attacks over there. And although this can apply to any situation, this is specifically an attack on your immediate family. Your spouse, your children, those closest to you. You're fighting in other arenas. And, you know, you're trying to get the victory. You're fighting to get ahead. You're fighting, you know, in your business, in your career, for your finances. And the enemy behind your back gets into your house. More generally speaking, but equally applicable, Ziklag is where before you can get a breakthrough in one area, here comes something else. 
It's compounded adversity, compounded trouble, compounded issues and ordeals, compounded attacks that you did not see coming. It, it sucker punched you. It was a surprise attack. It was something you were not prepared for. It's, it's where you're exhausted, dumbfounded. Something jumped you. You, you didn't plan for this. And, and, you know, and it pushes you to your breaking point. Now, before we go any further, my family, listen carefully. If Ziklag doesn't happen, there will be no crown. Your Ziklag is part of the process. Your Ziklag is making you stronger. Your Ziklag drives you to your knees to seek the Lord like you've never gone after him before. How many of you know Moses was in the wilderness for 40 years? Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days. Paul spent three years in the desert. Joseph was in the pit and in prison. And that was the testing ground. That was the proving ground. That was the university of adversity. And listen, you may not get your diploma. You may not get your degree. You may not graduate. You may not sit on the throne until you reach Hebron or Jerusalem. But you passed your finals at Ziklag. These men had been in a fight. How many of you know fights are exhausting? Even if you win, they're exhausting. E even if you win, you will incur some damage. Even if you win, you might do so with a black eye and a bloody nose. You may win and still get stabbed. You'll have bruises, broken bones, battle scars. You see, you can be a winner and still be wounded. You can win and be tired. You can win and be weary. You can win and have nothing left for the next battle. You, you can bring back your marriage from the brink of divorce and be exhausted from saving it. You can win the lawsuit and be drained emotionally and financially by it. You, you can be reinstated to your position or even get the promotion, but you had to scratch and claw and put in the long hours. You got it. You won, but you're spent. You're battle weary. You, you can win and still have PTSD. You go to bed tired, you wake up tired, and every day seems like it's about three days long. I want you to know something. I'm not talking about theology today. This isn't just a Bible lesson. This is something that Pastor Elena and I have lived recently. You know, when Pastor Dave went home to be with the Lord on February the 27th, 2018, and we got the call that afternoon. We were here the next day. We were here on February the 28th. And we were in a whirlwind of, of everything that was going on at that time. We were, we were setting up all of the memorial, all of the, the private meetings. The, we were doing all kinds of stuff, trying to, trying to just do everything that we possibly could. At the same time, our kids are back in Texas, so we're trying to make sure that they're okay and then, and, then, and then flying back and forth and Pastor Elena pastoring basically the church in Texas while I'm here, we're swapping places, we're meeting, when we, we're doing all of that. Trey is about to graduate high school at that time. Gian's going into high school at that time. We've got to tell a wonderful congregation in Texas that has been enjoying the blessing of God and is growing and expanding and about to build a brand new cutting edge sanctuary. We have to tell them that we're not going to be there anymore. We got to figure that out. We got to buy a home up here. We've got to sell that home. And then, you know, once the announcements are made, the attacks come from just, can I just be honest with you? From covetous and jealous people. 
But we're fighting over here, over here, over here, and this starts coming. Do you know, I just have to tell you something very personal. There's one night, Pastor Lane and I, right, we're, we, we, th- we're here on a given weekend together. We're in the hotel. We haven't bought a house yet or anything. We're in the middle of all this stuff. Do you know that for the first time in my life, I get up in the middle of the night. I, in the middle of the night, I get up and I am panicked. And, and Pastor Lane gets up and she says, what's wrong? And I looked at her and I'm panicking. And I said, where am I? And she said, you're in New Jersey, in the hotel. I said, okay. (laughs) That happened. And then then we're here and all of this is going on and the attacks, the, the, the lying, the slander, the libel that's going on. Meanwhile, we're living in a temporary place. We're living in a townhouse in Perth Amboy and our whole family is sleeping on air mats for six air mattress. Listen, the preferred bedding in hell are air mattresses. (laughs) Promise. You say, well, how did you sleep? We didn't. No, no, no. We, seriously, we were putting in 12 to 14 hour days every single day. And they're, they're, they're chock full of stuff. 12 to 14 hours every day. We'd get back to that townhouse. We would eat and pass out for real. Go to bed tired. Wake up tired. And every day feels like it's three days long. You see, everybody's impressed with the mighty warrior but they don't see the struggle beneath. They see the armor, but they don't see the bruises beneath the armor. See, you can win a victory. You can come back with the spoils of war and not be able to fully enjoy the spoils because it cost you too much to get the victory. David comes back from the battle and he's looking for comfort and he only gets conflict. Have you ever been looking for comfort and all you got was more conflict? You you expected to rest, but all you got was another mess. Your expectation was to go on vacation, but you couldn't even get a staycation because you had more aggravation. Oh, you ought to say, "Oh, oh, snap, I worked hard on that sentence. And it can wear you down. (laughs) You go to work, conflict. At the house, conflict. You come home, you go to bed, you can't sleep. You wake up to what? Conflict. And what happens is you wind up not starting to look for comfort anymore. Because you don't think you'll ever get to enjoy victory. You, You don't think you'll ever even get a break to take a breath. And so you start to only expect conflict. And if you only expect conflict, that is what you will attract into your life. And it is exactly what the Amalekites want you to do. Get discouraged and quit. David has fought the Philistines. He's been blindsided by the Amalekites. And now his own men want to kill him. And that's a hard thing. That is a painful thing. These men were close. They'd been through a lot together. They were trusted. They were like family. It's hard to have to fight somebody you love. Somebody in here today, you know about this. You know what it's like to have survived something only to find the people who should be happy for you are not. Somebody in here knows what it's like to have your good evil spoken of, to be falsely accused, to be erroneously blamed, to have people who are supposed to love you question your integrity and question your character. To have to battle out there and to come to find that the people you who who once fought for you and who once fought with you have now decided to fight you. See, David may have been injured outwardly in the battle, but now he's injured inwardly because he's been betrayed by the very people he gave purpose to. 
I mean, where would those guys be without David? God used David to make their lives exponentially better, and they turn on him. Sometimes the people you help the most are the quickest to turn on you. That alone is worth the price of admission right there. So David's at a bad place. He's at an all-time low. He's tired. He feels sick in the pit of his stomach. He, he feels all alone. He's in despair. He's distressed. That, that word in Hebrew is yotzad. And it means to be straightened in a narrow place. We, we would say it like this. He's between a rock and a hard place. That word yotzad also means to be vexed. And then the Bible says, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Say it with me today. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Now say it in a loud voice. Ready? But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. In the Lord his He did it in the Lord his God. The Lord there would have been the yod Hey vav Hey unspeakable name of God. We would translate it as Yahweh or as Jehovah. The Israelites would have translated that as Adonai is Elohim. Ad the Lord his God. He would say, I'm encouraging myself that, 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 it is, that he is my Lord and my God. Sound familiar? Have you ever had to encourage yourself in the Lord your God? Your, your, your kids were doing their thing. They, they were too busy with their world to even know that you had a problem. Your spouse is equally tired and exhausted from fighting the battles alongside of you. Your extended family couldn't even grasp what you're going through. There's no greeting card for this. There's no Netflix comedy that's going to lift this off of you. There's no emoji, bitmoji, or gif that's going to do it. Nobody else can do it. Nobody else will do it. But the truth is, nobody else is supposed to do it. That This is your work. This is your responsibility. This is on you. God has already given you everything you will ever need and more 2,000 years ago on a cross outside of Jerusalem. Listen to me. Now you're going to have to appropriate it. You're going to have to apply. You're going to have to search the scriptures. You're going to have to remember in the moment who God is and who you are in him. You're going you're gonna to have to lift your hands. You're going to have to lift your voice. You're going to have to get on your knees. You're going to have to get on your face. And you're going to have to speak life over yourself. Encourage yourself in the Lord your God. Be encouraged that the Lord is God. Be encouraged that Yahweh is Elohim, that your covenant God is also the creator, sustainer God, the one who loves you with an everlasting love, controls everything. Hey, you need to speak that over yourself. You need to speak over yourself that the one who saved you will keep you. The one who saved you will never let you go. The one who saved you will never let you down. He's your Lord and your God. You're going to have to say to yourself, Jesus is Lord. The situation is not Lord. The circumstance is not Lord. The adversity is not Lord. The tragedy is not Lord. The enemy is definitely not Lord. What other people blame shift onto you is not Lord. Other people's deflections are not Lord. You need to speak over yourself. Jesus is Lord. He is the Word made flesh. He is God, the Son. All things were made by Him, for Him, and through Him. He who did not spare His only begotten Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not all? Also with him, freely give us all things. And I am complete in him. 
I am the head and not the tail, above only and never beneath. I have the mind of Christ. I have the power of the Spirit. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. I'm blessed and highly favored. I am accepted in the beloved. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Why? Because Jesus is Lord. Jesus is your resiliency. Jesus is your bounce back ability. Jesus is your comeback. And he says, I will restore. Pick it up in verse 7 with me. And David said to Abiathar, the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. Real quickly, the ephod, there was an ephod for the high priest and there was an ephod for other priests, a more common ephod. It was made of linen. It's basically a vest. It's a vestment that would come down to the thighs. Again, it's made of linen. And here's what it represented very quickly. When you put it on, you were saying, I am covered in the presence of God. And when you put it on, you're also saying, and I have favor with God, I'm special to him. How many of you know under the new covenant, every single believer is wearing an ephod, whether they know it or not, because you have the presence of God with you everywhere you go, and you have the favor of God, you're special to him. And Abiathar brought hither the ephod to David, and David inquired at the Lord, saying, shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he, God, answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. I want you to notice David's inquiry and God's response. David says, Shall I pursue? Shall I overtake? God says, Yes, but God adds, and you'll recover all. David didn't ask about recovering all, but God added it. How many of you are glad that your God, listen to me, he's the God of more than enough. How many of you are glad that he makes us more than conquerors because he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think? And now notice how emphatic the Lord's responses are. Should I pursue? Should I overtake? God says pursue. Don't run from, run at it. Don't run away, run at it. Don't hide from it, confront it. Don't stick your head in the sand and make believe that somehow it's going to go away. Stop avoiding the thing that has been staring you down. Pursue. The kingdom of God suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. This is not for the weak of heart. This is for those who have the capacity to encourage themselves in the Lord. This is for those who will be strong and of a good courage. This is for those who lean on the Lord for supernatural strength. Listen to me. This is where you get aggressive. This is where you double dog dare yourself. This is where you declare, this is mine. What you've taken from me does not belong to you. It's mine. Victory is mine. This is where after having done all the stand, you stand there for. This is where you put on the whole armor of God. This is where you walk in a spirit of faith no matter how weary you are, no matter who goes with you, and no matter what gets in your way. What does God say? Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them. God again adds the surely. You shall surely, not maybe, not it's a possibility. God's not saying, well, let me see, let me pontificate, let me prayerfully consider this, and then I'll decide. Listen to me, my family. God doesn't have to decide about what he has promised. Once he promises, it's settled. If a promise has been made, he has already decided. And what he promises, he is faithful to perform. 
If God has promised, then the verdict is in. If he's promised, it's because the debt has been paid. It has been finished. Listen to me. God doesn't have to decide. He already decided before the world was made because the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. God has already decided about your healing. God has already decided about your forgiveness. God has already decided about your recovery. He's already decided about your freedom, your peace, your joy, your provision. He's already decided about your abundance. Jesus said, that's why I came. I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. You shall surely overtake your enemies. Most definitely. Defeat is not an option because the battle belongs to the Lord. He is your shield and your buckler. That's why you can take up the shield of faith with which you will quench every fiery dart of the wicked. You shall surely overtake. Listen to me. Ahab may be in his chariot, but the hand of God is on you, and you'll outrun him. Your enemies may come in at you one way, but they have to flee seven ways. Pursue. For thou shalt surely overtake them and without fail, without fail, recover all. Not some, not a portion, not just enough to get by, not just enough to keep your head above water. Without fail, you shall recover all. Somebody needs to receive that today. Somebody has had something stolen from them, something taken from them. It shouldn't have happened. You were fighting on one front, but the enemy came in and he snuck and he took something from you. You need to say it today. I'm going to, for sure, I'm recovering all. 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 Without fail, you shall recover all. Listen to me, my family. You will not fail. Failure is not an option. Freedom is not an option. Restoration is not just an option. Recovery is not just an option. Listen to me. It is not. Sometimes God says yes, and sometimes God says no. No, listen to me. All of the promises of God are yes and amen. You've been blessed. You have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, and he has, past tense, already given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. He forgives all your iniquities and heals all your diseases. See, recovery is not a possibility. It's a promise. Say that with me. Recovery is not a possibility. It's a promise. Now believe that it's a promise. Act like it's a promise. Govern your emotional responses like you've got a promise from an all-powerful God who loves you. Make your decisions based on the fact that you've got a promise and receive it in your heart as a promise. Verse 9, it says, So David went, he and the 600 men that were with him, and came to the brook Besor, where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued. He and 400 men, for 200 abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook Besor. So one out of every three of David's men were too tired. They were too exhausted. Big, burly, ambidextrous ex-cons. Warriors fighting men from their youth collapsed. They couldn't go any further. Listen, here we see it again. Not everybody can go with you. Not everybody should go with you. Not everybody will go with you. Not everybody is up for the battle that you're about to fight. Not everybody has the capacity to face disappointment after disappointment after disappointment and still keep fighting onward. So let them stay. I said let them stay. 
David didn't take them. He, he didn't take them. David didn't rebuke them either. He didn't rebuke them because they were tired. But he had to keep moving. Listen to me. There are some people you have to love but keep moving. I said there are some people you have to love but keep moving. I'm sorry you fainted, but I still have to fight. I'm sorry that you're exhausted, I, that you don't have the strength, that you can't get yourself together right now. I do feel bad for you, but I still have to fight. See, listen to me. You can't afford the extra burden now. You can't afford to carry someone into the battle who cannot contribute. Oh, my goodness. Did you hear that? If you're going to bounce back, if you're going to be resilient, if you're going to mount a comeback from the setback that you had, there are times you cannot carry other people with you who will not contribute to your resiliency. He loved them. Later on, he's going to make sure they get the spoils of war. But he had to keep moving. It's okay. You're not mad. But they need to stay at the brook. I said, they need to stay at the brook. You can't cross over the brook with, okay, stay on that side. Stay at the brook, but I got to go up the mountain. See, listen to me. You don't have time or energy to babysit per certain people in your life. Listen to me. These are supposed to be David's mighty men. This is not David's daycare. You, 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 you don't have the time. You got a battle to fight. Your city's been burnt down. Your family is in peril. You don't have time to pat everybody on the back and give them nice little pep talks. Not now. So if they can't encourage themselves in the Lord, let them stay. When 200 warriors, 200 warriors couldn't go any further, David still did. Because he encouraged himself in the Lord. Listen to me. Stop feeling guilty that you renewed your strength. Stop feeling guilty that you didn't give up when other people did. Stop feeling guilty because you didn't quit when other people quit. Stop apologizing for your endurance. Stop apologizing for your perseverance. Stop apologizing for the fact that you're still standing. You see, it's not about how many you have with you. I said, it's not about how many you have with you. For nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. It's not about the quantity. It's about the quality. What kind of quality? What kind of character? What kind of quality and character do you have? And what kind of inner fortitude? What kind of resolve to those who are with you? What kind do they have? I'll take 400 people that go weary into battle with David than the 3,000 people that left Jesus in one day because they didn't understand something he said. 400 committed people are better than 3,000 fragile, fickle, temperamental church hoppers any day. It's called addition by subtraction. With Gideon, 300 were better than 32,000. Jesus, with just 12 men, turned the world upside down and radically altered the trajectory of human history. You see, some people get beaten in the battle while others get better in the battle. Ready? 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 I want to say this to you today. If the enemy had some wisdom, he would have never jumped on you. I said, if the enemy had some wisdom, he would have never jumped on you. See, there's something about jumping on you that ignites you. It fires you up. You're more motivated. You become more of a threat to the realm of darkness. You fight better when you have to. You fight better when your back is to the wall. You fight better when you have no choice. 
You're, you're, you're the kind of person who says, listen, if I'm going to go down, it will not be without a fight. I was going to quit. I was going to quit. But wait a minute. My God is not a quitter. My God is a warrior. My God is the undisputed, undefeated, all-time champion. His power is unstoppable. His might is unconquerable. His record is, was, and will ever be perfect. And he's on my side. I might as well fight. David went. He pursued. Let's finish up with this. Let's jump down to verse 17. And David smote them from the twilight even unto the evening of the next day. And there escaped not a man of them, save 400 young men which rode upon camels and fled. And David recovered all. Say that with me. And David recovered all. Say it again. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. Say it again. David recovered all. My family, you need to hear this today. If you have been through battle after battle after battle, if you face disappointment and adversity and trauma, if in a short period of time you've had a long period of trouble, something's about to happen. The closer the waves, the closer the contractions come, the baby is about to be born. Now watch this, watch this, watch this. David gets victory over the Amalekites, over the sneaky cowards, over the underbelly of the serpent. He gets the victory. He pursues, overtakes, and recovers all, ready, with less men than he defeated the Philistines with. Are you ready? You're going to be able to do more with less. I said, you're going to be able to do more with less. Why? Because God is with you. Because God fights for you. Because overwhelming victory is yours through our Lord Jesus Christ. In this next battle, even though the odds are against you, God is for you. And if God be for you, who can be against you? You will do more with less because the Lord is on your side and he does for you what you could never do for yourself. So listen, use what you've got left. You may not have a lot left, but use what you've got left. You may be running on empty. You may be running on fumes. You may be running on the reserves, but reach way down deep and use what you've got left. Use whatever you've got. Listen to me. Take your rod in your hand. Take five stones and a sling. Take a jar of oil. Take your two mites. Take two fish and five loaves. Take your fish sandwich. Take whatever you have left and watch God multiply it into more. A bigger victory with less work. A bigger victory with a smaller circle. A bigger victory with less resources. A bigger victory with less support. A bigger victory with less money. A bigger victory with less effort. Why? Because God is able. Pursue, overtake, and recover all. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. You're coming out of this season with more. You're coming out of this battle with more. You're coming straight out of Ziklag with more. Okay, final thought, final thought, final thought. Wow, you're very long-winded today. Okay, ready? Final thought. The very next chapter, Saul and Jonathan are killed in the battle. David receives word from an Amalekite messenger, and he says, who told you? 
Because he's learned you don't always listen to the first person who tells you something. Another subject for another time. But the young man hands him Saul's bracelet and Saul's crown. Oh. The young man hands over Saul's bracelet and Saul's crown. David is handed over the king's crown at Ziklag. He's anointed king over Judah, leading to him becoming king, the shepherd king over all of Israel. Can I just tell you something? It was all worth it. It was all worth it. Listen to me. The shepherd boy becomes the shepherd king of Israel to whom God promises that there will never be a time that there is a throne and a descendant of his is not on that throne. And so it is this day because this day there's a throne in heaven and on that throne is seated one who is called Son of Jes son of David, Yeshua Bar David, Jesus, the son of David, sits on the throne in heaven. My family ready? The crown comes to you at Ziklag. Sell it to somebody, the crown comes to you at your Ziklag. There may have been something stolen from you. There may have been something that the enemy burnt to the ground while you were weary, while you were fighting on another front, while others wouldn't support you, while, while others turned on you. But Ziklag is evidence. It is your proving ground. It is your place of promotion. Your Ziklag is a gateway. Your Ziklag is a portal. It is a rite of passage to new possibilities beyond your world wildest dreams. Your Ziklag, listen to me carefully, is an open door to a new anointing. The fight was worth it. Encouraging yourself in the Lord paid off big. Because your pain is about to become your gain. Because you had the God-given intestinal fortitude. Because you had the guts. You're about to see the glory. You may be one year and four months in Ziklag. But the crown is a crown of glory. Listen to me. It's a crown of glory that will never fade away. And the crown that you'll be crowned with, no one can ever take from you. Because that crown was delivered to you by the Lord. Lord, your God at Ziklag. Stand with me if you would.